Hello and welcome to Mindful Biology. This is our second of five talks about non-duality. We're looking at three main dualities in this series, as described in the first talk, the introduction. We'll explore the separation we feel between mind and body, between self and other, and between self and the earth. Today we'll focus on the first of those, the apparent duality between mind and body. I think it's safe to say that many of us feel separated and alienated from our living body with all of its sensations, feelings, living processes, discomforts, and so on. There are many reasons for this, some of which we understand well, some of which we may be less familiar with. And I'll mention one as we proceed later in the talk. But understanding why we feel separate from the body is, I think, much less important than doing something about it. Dissolving the sense of separation and living in greater communion with the body that is, after all, our constant companion from the beginning of our individual life to its end. This is a very rich direction to work spiritually. So I'm excited to be sharing it with you, sharing my understanding of mind-body duality and how to soften it. I hope you find this video helpful. Let's proceed. So again, we're looking at these dualities in this term. Today, we'll focus on the top one, but I want to say a little bit about how each of these dualities relates to different regions in the body. So the apparent separation between the mind and the body has, I believe, the most to do with our conceptual brain, how we form ideas and opinions. This is what I've called in previous videos, the head body. When we talk about the duality between self and others, we're working more with the relational core of the body that area we sometimes refer to as our heart, and that I have called, for the sake of clarity, the heart body, to provide a specific term that I've used in previous discussions. Finally, when we work with the duality, the apparent duality between self and earth, we're working with what I've called the earth body, the region of the organism that has a lot to do with stabilizing us on the planet. Well, as mentioned today, we're going to focus on the mind-body duality, and so we'll be using this idea of the brain-body as a sort of starting point. So the brain-body is the mental part of us, the thinking, planning, and remembering, reasoning, calculating, categorizing, judging functions of our experience. We're very adept at using this aspect of our biology, and it plays a big role in modern life. In the ideal, we would be able to bring our mental awareness into close alignment with the rest of the body, with our relational heart body and our grounding earth body. But for a variety of reasons, this is often difficult we feel pain in the body, we're not used to sensing into it, we are preoccupied and anxious about our plans and memories, and they seem to be very important, so the mind wants to stay up in its cloud of thinking rather than being down in the substance of the body. And so the effect is we spend a lot of time in this cloud, as it were, kind of hovering a bit above the eyes and behind the skull, a space that surrounds the head region rather vaguely in which we have the sense that our thinking unfolds. Now there are ways to bring the mind into closer alignment with the body to remove it from the cloud and plant it in the organism and that's what we'll be focusing on today. To review from last time, something that we're all aware of is that we do have a body and we do have a mind that is closely connected in some way with this vital organ that we refer to as a brain. 
And the thinking parts of that brain have this very strong tendency and a very powerful ability to separate from the body and look back upon it as if from a kind of distance, to examine it as if it were a thing in the environment. This is most obvious when we look in the mirror, but it comes up a lot when we think about the body in many other ways. For instance, when we think about our health, the health of our organ systems and so on. For many reasons, as I mentioned, the separation can be quite extreme. We can feel alienated and frightened even of the organism that gives us life. Now, there are, as I said, many reasons for this. One I want to focus on is the attitude modern medicine brings to bear. Now, I was a surgeon in my time. That was a, quite a while ago because I had to retire early due to some health conditions. So I understand the power and value of modern medicine quite well, but it does have uh, some downsides when it comes to our relationship with the body and how connected to it we feel. So here we're looking at a robotic surgical procedure. The surgeon is actually that guy over on the left who's manning the controls of all the instrumentation that's hovering above the patient. A patch of the patient's uh, abdomen, I think that's the abdomen, is visible underneath all of those arms of the robotic devices. Now, this is a very powerful technology, but it gives us the sense when we go to see physicians, when we undergo procedures, that the body is a kind of machine that can be tinkered with and repaired just like an automobile or any other uh, machinery. Now, there is some value to the machine metaphor for the body. There are some parts that seem pretty mechanical, like the way muscles move uh, bones and pivot them around joints. That's demonstrably rather mechanical. But to use the machine metaphor for the entire body, for this organism that is our constant companion, I think is rather hazardous for our well-being. A healthier metaphor would be to remember that after all, the body is an organism, an animal. It's a mammal, it's sensitive, and it thrives when it feels safe, protected, and supported. And so by remembering the body in a more mammalian way, as a living, sensitive organism, we can dissolve that strong sense of separation and alienation and distrust and replace it with a softer feeling of relationship where there's love for the mind from the body and love for the body from the mind. Now, you may not feel that your body loves you. I haven't always. But when you think about how much it does to support your life and to keep you going and to absorb the blows of the mistakes you made and so on, I think we could say that it is at least very supportive and that support counts as a kind of love in this context. Well, if we can feel that loving attitude in and toward the body, we will be much more comfortable moving our consciousness down into the substance of it. And so that's what we're striving toward in this talk today. But we'll take it in stages, and I want to begin by looking at this brain that has so much to do with our mental experience, with this area that I refer to as the brain body, this zone of thinking and planning and so on. So we're looking here at the outside appearance of the brain, which we're, I think, very familiar with in the present era. But there's an also a kind of interior view that we could imagine at least, and that's the electrical activity in the brain. So each little flash of light that we see in this simulation that was produced by a neuroscientist is meant to represent the pulse of electricity in a single nerve cell. So all nerve cells in the brain are pulsing with some regularity. Now, some do it very fast, tens or hundreds of times a second. Others are much more quiescent, maybe pulsing only every few seconds, but they're all a little bit active and the collective activity is what we're looking at here. But there's one issue that's very important to keep in mind and that's that this simulation is meant to only show about a millionth of the actual amount of electrical pulsing going on in the brain. So there's this very active, sparkling, pulsating, energetic activity going on in your brain right now as you watch this video. 
and in all the activities of your life. Now I want to add to our stock of metaphors by saying that movement in the brain of electrical impulses is somewhat wave-like. It's been shown that waves of pulsing neural activity move across the surface of the brain as we take in sights and sounds, make sense of our environment, think, plan, move, and act. That it's like a continually flowing sea of activity, far more complicated than the ocean waves we're looking at here, but in some sense with a similar flavor. Another metaphor that I like to consider is the metaphor of a jungle. There's all this life inside the brain. It's a lush landscape of living cells, all interacting in a kind of internal ecosystem with little islands of activity here that do one thing and islands of activity there that do another thing, but a continual interplay and interconnection between all of it. So when we think about this sparkling flow of information in the brain, information and energy and life, we can imagine it now inside the body and in relation to the vital organs of the body, those regions that give us our feelings, after all. So we feel into our heart or our belly. And this activity up in the brain has ways of knowing what's going on in the belly. And the belly has no ways of knowing what's going on in the brain. There's a constant communication going both directions. Now, one very obvious way in which body communicates with brain and vice versa is through the nervous system. The brain is part of that nervous system, but there's a spinal cord that exits the brain Many nerves come off the spinal cord as well as off the brain itself. They spread throughout the body and they allow brain and body to communicate with one another more or less continually. One of the nerves that comes off the brain directly is the famous vagus nerve. If you have anything to do with therapy these days, with psychotherapy, you probably know about the vagus. It seems to have a lot to do with our interpersonal comfort levels, how we respond with people, whether we feel safe or threatened, and so on. It's a very socially oriented uh, system in the body. Of course, the nerves also go out to the muscles and joints and provide the brain with information about how the body is positioned and moving in space. Nerves also connect with the skin and provide information about pressure and vibration and uh, points of contact and so on. So the brain and body are in, connect, in communication in all of these ways through the nervous system. But they're also in communication through various uh, circulatory patterns uh, in the blood in particular, but also the lymph fluids that flow through the body. So as blood circulates, it moves immune cells and hormones and other uh, chemicals around that signal various states of being to the brain. So the brain knows what's going on in the body and send likewise information from the brain to the body so the body knows how uh, to respond moment by moment. And the two are in this communication in service of keeping us alive and uh, helping us thrive. Even the senses that we normally think of as connecting us with the outside world, you know, with the world beyond the boundary of the body, the eyes, the nose, the taste sensors in the mouth, the hearing apparatus that we call an ear, even those senses provide information. So we have a kind of mirror on the body when we look into an actual mirror, but also when we hear our own bodily noises, when we taste our skin or taste what's going on inside our mouths or smell our own body odor, to be frank. You know, we have that kind of feedback too that connects body and brain. So with all these ways for the body to communicate with the brain and vice versa, we can appreciate how the idea that the mind is somehow separate from the body in any meaningful way 
begins to fall apart. It looks a little questionable. Contemplating how the body communicates so intimately with the mind and brain is a valuable practice. We can settle, if we wish, into a comfortable posture right now. and feel into the chest and belly. We can notice the movement of muscle and bone as the body breathes. So the bones of the rib cage, the muscles between the ribs and in the belly are active and moving with each breath. And we can feel this because of the nerves that connect this region to the brain. We can feel the surface of the skin, our clothing where it touches or rubs, the furniture where it presses against the torso. Because there are nerves connecting the skin with the brain. We can feel deep into the heart and lung area feeling the movement of breath on the inside as the lungs fill, a very subtle sensation with a slight coolness on the in-breath and a slight warmth on the out-breath deep in the chest. And we can feel the emotional tone, partly related by the vagus nerve how the inner body is responding to our mood and emotions right now, how it feels in this moment in the heart and chest area. We can feel. This practice can be continued if the video is paused or taken up later, but we'll move on. So we have this cloud of mental activity that hovers above us in a vague way, at least this is my sense of it, that it's a little bit above and behind my eyes. It's probably not quite as far away from the body as I'm representing it here, but however far away it is, despite that distance, it has continual information coming to it from the body. And the body is continually listening to what's going on in the brain. So the two are constantly communicating, talking with one another. Now up in the brain, the information from the body is organized and the thinking processes are also organized in important ways. Remember, we looked at the outside of the brain and said that it's something that we're now very familiar with. And that appearance of the brain has been known uh, for quite a while. Back in the 19th century, people came up with the reasonable idea that different parts of the brain do different things. They take care of different parts of our lived experience. They had this intuition partly because of the effect of various local brain injuries and what happened to people uh, when they were injured in particular regions. At first, of course, the understanding uh, was rather fanciful, but over time, we did begin to develop an idea that certain brain regions are devoted to certain functions. For instance, what we call you know, the mental aspect of our life, particularly the planning, remembering, verbalizing part of it, tends to be located more or less toward the front of the brain. And many of the representations of the body are located more in the middle of the brain, as shown. Now, the mind functions are not only in the forehead, they're distributed widely, and the body functions are not only in the middle part of the brain, they're also distributed widely. But there is a kind of concentration in this way. The region I'm referring to as the mind part of the brain is something you probably have heard of called the prefrontal cortex. So it's the cortex of the brain that's up toward the front and in front of what is the frontal lobe in other animals. We have this kind of extension forward that goes beyond the frontal lobe 
of most other mammals that we call the prefrontal cortex. We can think of this as the seat of thinking. That's quite simplistic, but it'll do for our purposes. Thinking is much more widely distributed than this. There are actually multiple maps of the body on the brain surface and in its substance, one of which is called the somatosensory cortex. So it lays out representation of the body across the surface of the brain as shown. So that, for instance, the face is down lower than the hand and arm in this image. The somatosensory cortex actually tucks down into the middle of the brain, between the two brain hemispheres. So you can see it kind of wrapping from the middle where the foot is represented and the genitalia up over the top of the brain down toward the hand and then the face. Now there's another map. Like I said, there are actually several maps of the body within the brain, but another one is deep in its substance. It's a region called the insula. And here there's a map. It's not as detailed as this picture might suggest. It's not as anatomically uh, precise as this, but it gives us the interior experience of sensations within the body core. The feeling of uh, fullness in our stomach, for instance, is partly uh, the responsibility of this region called the insula. So the idea is we have multiple maps of the body, and then we have this thinking bit up front in the prefrontal cortex. Now this is all one organ that we call a single brain. It's not in two organs. There's not a thinking brain and then a body brain. It's just one organ. And yet we have this sense of a duality, that the two are somehow separate from one another. But we can see, looking at this, that that's kind of an illusion. There's no barrier there that blocks mind from body. It's really more of an idea than anything else. And this should be even more obvious when we think of all that sparkling, flowing activity and how it's automatically going to kind of draw everything together in certain ways. So if we want to connect our mind, our mental life, more closely with the body, we can see that there is a lot that helps. There are all the channels that provide communication between body and brain or mind. So they help bring the two together. At the same time, we can understand that within the brain itself, areas devoted to mental life and areas devoted to bodily feeling are not separated by any kind of barrier and neural activity flows back and forth throughout the surface and depth of the brain providing lots of opportunity for the two to communicate and behave as a coherent whole. Thus, what we feel in our body and what goes on in our so-called mind is of a piece. In both cases, we're talking about this sparkling, pulsing, aliveness of cellular activity. There's no difference in that activity in basic form between what's going on in the front part of the brain where the thinking functions tend to reside or in the middle part of the brain where the bodily representations are concentrated. There's neural activity in both locations, and they are close together and communicating in many ways. And this can help us then gradually bring our mental attention more aligned with and consistently interested in the form of our bodies, what's going on inside them. And of course, what we feel there is alive. It's alive in the way a jungle is alive, all that growth, intertwining, the various islands of activity. We have this complex life going on all the time within. And there is a wave-like feeling in the body-mind. We can feel waves of sensation, waves of awareness that move through that cloud that we call 
mind, and through the substance we call body. And they can begin to be seen to have the same basis in life. To begin with, we may not need to bring our sense of center right down into the chest or belly to bring mind and body together. We can just feel how the two flow naturally without a detectable barrier separating them. And this can be a nice meditation. And so I invite you to settle again into a comfortable posture. And to feel again into your chest area. Feel the rise and fall of the chest wall with breath. Feel how the skin wraps around and embraces the torso. Feel deep in the chest how air moves in and out, cool coming in, warm flowing out. There's all that rich sensation in the chest, in the torso. And feel the spaciousness of that experience. How you have a volume inside you, inside this body, front to back and side to side. You can feel an inner spaciousness. And then feel up into the mind and brain region, how there too there is spaciousness, how there too there is movement, only here it is movement of thought, movement of imagination. You can feel the space of your mind, or you could hold the image of a whole room, the one you're in right now, even without opening your eyes, you can picture it. There's that much room in there. And then notice how the space of the mind and the space of the torso and chest are not separated in your awareness. How easy it is to flow from mind to heart and back again in your attention. There's no boundary that separates the two. They flow seamlessly as a whole. And this meditation can be continued as long as you like.